You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is October 8, 2012, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portpoint. Our topic today, Patient Management Conference, the ACHU Syndrome. Our presenter is Dr. Nikita Raji. She's an Allergy Immunology Fellow at Children's Mercy Hospitals and Clinics. This uh, morning with COLA, the first conference is Patient Management by Nikki Federaje, one of our second year fellows. And I'm going to go ahead and let her get started. All right, so let me get started with patient management. So my objectives are to be aware of the entity of injectable sneezing. Which yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Um, to be able to develop a differential diagnosis for intractable sneezing and to be aware of the various treatments reported so far for the for these cases. So pretest, what is the most common etiology for intractable sneezing? Foreign body in the nasal cavity, psychogenic, nasal septal deviation or genetic. Following is a characteristic of what is called a chew syndrome. <laughs> sneezing with sunlight, sneezing with fullness after meals, and sneezing with periocular injections, or all of them up. I actually just have two questions. I can think of another one. <laughs> so the chief complaint for my patient was sneezing that was ongoing for four months uh, intermittently. History of presenting illness. This was an 80-year-old boy who developed sneezing episodes that started in the month of May. He, he would sneeze anywhere from two to two four hours and he gave me a record of like 284 sneezes in those, maybe it was actually within first hour or so. That was for one specific episode, but he could sneeze for hours. Um, the first episode started when he was at school, but since then he has had episodes at home, at friends places, whether it's outdoors or indoors, daytime, nighttime, really didn't have a pattern. No positional variation, no triggers that were noted. These episodes uh, also occurred during, during sleep. Uh, he had disturbed sleep, poor school performance, had been sent home from school on multiple occasions due to sneezing that would not stop. Episodes occur about once or twice a day. There's no history of nasal drainage or fevers at that time. He may have cough, nasal congestion, scratchy throat at some t at times, but not on others. No history of scented candle or air freshener use, no history of uh, smoke exposure. He was treated with mometazone nasal spray, cetirizine, and Benadryl by his pediatrician, and then allergy panel was obtained by, by the pediatrician. His Bermuda grass was 1.95, dust mite 7.5 and 10, rest of the panel was negative. Um, this was before we saw him. Dust mite precautions were taken, they also tried, this was like over a period of months and they had done everything that you could think of. Dust mite precautions, they got air purifiers thinking that might help. They changed air filters every month, sometimes even earlier than that. Um, then his medications were switched. When he, when he saw our clinic first, he, he was switched to olopecinide nasal spray, flutecasone so nasal spray given fexofenadin. Um, Nasal lavage was done daily. Uh, none of the medications or the lifestyle modifications helped. Any questions so far? Anything that you can think of? Should I go ahead? Yeah. When did it start again? In the month of May, okay. he was at school. It started. They think he was outdoors at that time, but then it has happened multiple times at other places. So the rest of the history, not really significant, no other medical history, no, but he has had tonsillectomy and adenoidectomy surgery in the past, um, no history of allergies in the family, <laughs> no similar history in the family either. Uh, he lives with his parents and siblings, uh, and one of them is a 10-month-old, uh, no stress or at home or school that was reported, no smoke exposure, no pets. 
physical was pretty much normal. Maybe he had some mildly image disturbance, but nothing that would stand out. Um, he, uh, we got the spirometry and it was normal. And then pretty much the diagnosis was intractable uh, sneezing. We didn't have an etiology or differential uh, foreign body in the nasal cavity. That was one of the common ones that, you know, the anatomical defects, autonomic or psychogenic. And at that point, we were actually looking at the literature to see what we could do for him at that point. He didn't, he didn't sneeze while he was in our clinic, um, but mom said it was just random. It could happen any time, so it didn't really matter. So at that point, um, we we looked up literature to see how we could treat him. Uh, some of the things that came up in literature was the use of topical anesthetic, uh, so use of lidocaine. Um, we used two percent solution. It advised him to apply it to the nasal cavity as needed basis. Um, we we consult. We put in an ENT consult to look for anatomical issues. They, they actually ended up seeing ENT and they ordered a CAT scan of the head and sinuses, which showed mild opacification of paranasal sinuses, but again, nothing prominent. Um, I don't think ENT advised anything else apart from the anesthetic use at that point. Um, neurology consult was placed, actually it's still pending, and then the next consideration would be psychiatry consult, but nothing so far that we have come up. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How does the lidocaine Work. Like, what does it do to stop this? Thing? So this is all, and I'll go over those things. You know, I'm I'm going to go over some literature, whatever is out there. So there are less than like 50 cases so far that are reported. So there there aren't many, and pretty much it's like I'll go over the pathway for sneezing, and that will explain why we try to do that. Doesn't work in all cases. It's case to case basis, and there are different different treatments that are that have been tried so far. Has anybody here seen anybody had uh, intractable sneezing episodes? No. I've only seen one, and um, where it's been intractable, you know, I mean, this went on for a half hour, so I thought that was pretty intractable. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there was a yeah. uh, yeah. it. Um, <laughs> the, um, there was a patient of mine who, of course, that'd be mine. Um, uh, there's a patient of mine who had this. Um, so I've been seeing for a number of years for food allergy. Um, and she was going away to college. And it was some, I don't know, it was like soy or something that had, it was one of these things where the primary care doctor had done a panel and we and we took they took away all these foods and then we were trying to get it back into the diet. And <clears throat> we even, I think, got Tina back into the diet or something or whatever. But she was going to go away to school and it was, it was like soy or, or wheat or something. There was something that was, Early common. But anyways, they wanted to see if they could, you know, get this dispelled so she wouldn't have to worry about which one went to college. So we came in and did this challenge, and, I, and her, you know, her skin test said the guys you were low. We thought, well, this will be nothing, and we'll just do this. So we did the challenge, and the, you know, the steps go fine, and we're watching her for two hours, and everything's fine. And she's in the notorious room A, which I think has some <laughs> kind of, some kind of voodoo on it. But anyway. Um, um, an hour and a half of waiting for two hours to let her go, she starts sneezing. And I've never seen anything like this, and I think Pam was the nurse with me, and she just started sneezing and she would not stop. It was just, I, you know, it, it made me nervous just watching her. She just sneezed and sneezed and sneezed and sneezed. This went on for a half hour. And so we gave her, we gave her, um, um, we gave her out, uh, uh, Oh, uh, antihistamine, we gave her, uh, we, I actually broke down and gave her epinephrine <laughs> because I just couldn't stop this. And uh, we, we squirted nasal steroids up her nose. We did, you know, uh, after, you did everything we could think of to try to get this to stop. And she sneezed and sneezed and sneezed. And finally, after a half hour, she just stopped. Now, why she did it, you know, what the thing was. But, I've, but um, it was just amazing. She just, I mean, it was just, she had one sneeze out the next sneeze. This was for a half hour. You know, I think that yeah. there'd be some kind of, you know, <laughs> cardiac event or something. Pass <laughs> <laughs> um, out. Seriously, it's trying blue. No, it was just, it was just uh, amazing. I've never seen anything like it. And hopefully, I'll never see it. 
<laughs> so like, a lot of the medications immediately cause symptom relief, like after administering them, they, she just waited. And no, it was, like, it, was a, it was a literal half hour, and when she was doing this for the, you know, like, for when it was going on for like three or four minutes, they go, okay, let's just give her some Benadryl and do that. And then she was just kept going and going, and the parents are looking like, well, can't you just stop? <laughs> so, so, so it's like, well, you know, is this related to the food? No, let's just go, okay, let's just give her happy. We have nothing to lose. And it didn't stop. And it was just, it just right. went on and on. And so, um, but I never heard from the parents that she ever had any, she never had any episodes like that before. And to my knowledge, she never had any episodes after that. But why she did that, was that related to the food? And why was it, you know, an hour and a half after the last dose? And you would expect that she was going to have something. She would have had it, you know, initially in the first few doses. And so um, maybe there's something about Room A that's, I, I, I think there's something. We'll, we'll have to we'll have to see when we move into the new building if we, we break the curse of um, <laughs> yeah. exam room A uh, uh -huh. one or whatever it is over there. Your patient didn't have a Netflix and video or anything, did they? They did not. They did no, not have a yeah. yeah. I think yeah. I should have put that out. Yeah. Hours, right? Yeah, but when he was in ENT the clinic, I know. In ENT horrible. clinic, he continued to sneeze all throughout the visit. Oh, he did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh gosh. Yeah. Very nice. Excuse me. Yeah. All right. So I'll just go over a little bit about sneezing and intractable sneezing. <laughs> thing. It's called trituration. Yeah, yeah. Of course, right? apparently. Oh. It's, a, it's a primary reflex that occurs due to spasmodic expiration after spasmodic inspiration. A um, little bit of history. It's funny that you know I found this in uh, online in 1590 when the, the bubonic plague was spread in Rome. And they observed that people died up shortly after sneezing. And that's where the Pope promoted people to say, may God bless you, as a blessing to those people to help protect yeah. them from it. And that's where it comes to where we say, may God bless, God bless you all the time. So. Uh, <laughs> so the other thing was, this was actually, you know, there, the, like this nurse, the children's rhyme, Ring Around the Roses, and it's both. Oh. It's ashes, ashes, and the way they explain it is it was around the same time and plague was around. Uh -huh. And ring around the rose is actually like a red mark that, that was noted as one of the symptoms or signs. Pocket full of food poses mean actually like the her herbs that were tried as a remedy for that. And then some might mean ashes, ashes, which actually means like they used to do like um, cremation for these patients. Mm -hmm. Or then it turned into a chew, a chew, which was like sneezing and then all fall down, so they said, whoever gets it, dies. So that's oh crazy, like, you know. Yeah. It's kind of morbid. Yeah. 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 I'm going to yeah. be famous with two version. That's much more exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so the physiology, uh, sneezing is, uh, is uh, made of like two phases, nasal and respiratory. Um, the nasal phase starts with the nasal mucosa stimulation, so any of the triggers that triggers the receptors in the, for the first and the second branch of trigeminal nerve, which is the fifth nerve, so that's the efferent for that for the reflex. The sneeze center has now been kind of located in rostral, dorsolateral medulla, um, and some lateral medullary syndrome sneezing is actually lost. Um, and the efferent part is with uh, autonomic portion of the seventh nerve. And once the sneeze, the nasal phase starts, the res it results in the nasal congestion and increased mucus secretion, and that actually sets off the respirator respiratory phase. So the second phase efferent is through, again, through the trigeminal sensory neurons via the fifth nerve, and it activates the brainstem center for inspiration, closer or closure of the nasal pharynx, and then the expiration. That's the normal physiology. Now, for the intractable sneezing, the, uh, the common causes that have been reported are anatomical, so septal deviation, nasal turbinate hypertrophy, and foreign foreign body in the nasal cavity. Allergic, so environmental allergies have been reported for maybe one or two cases, which were not really clear, and I'll go over those cases. And then one of the cases was trite, now amine sensitivity, and this was uh, uh, can, that this was one of the ingredients in um, stain removal, like stain cleaner, mm -hmm. that was added to the laundry detergent. And again, we'll go over that. So uh, that, those are the allergic causes 
autonomic, so exposure to sunlight or body surface chilling can cause intractable sneezing. Again, I'll go over that sunlight part again. Uh, some of the infections that have been rep reported are TB, polio, measles, plague. Um, neurological, so seizures have been reported, uh, and psychogenic. So the seizures, the only manifestation that they just... Initially, so for months and months, and I'll sh uh, show you that case where initially the only thing was sneezing and then they started having like sure. the rest of the symptoms where they realized it was. Mm. Sure. So genetic cause, a true syndrome, and it stands for autosomal dominant compelling heliohophthalmic outburst syndrome. And it actually, it's like online, it's from Wikipedia, sorry, there was no other source that I went to, but it affects like 18 to 35 percent of the population, more co common in Caucasians. Um, it is caused by a congenital malfunction in the nerve signals in the trigeminal nerve nuclei. So there is an association between the trigeminal nerve and the nerve that transmits the visual impulses to the brain. And when the, when the stimulation of the optic nerve, uh, which is the parasympathetic nerve that contracts the pupils, it triggers the trigeminal nerve and causes the, what is called, and the true syndrome, it's the, um, no, the second name for it is photic sneeze uh, reflex. They also actually have sneezing after periocular injections and sneezing due to fullness after meals. And I was surprised to know that I know someone who has this syndrome. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> uh, so you knew, who newly diagnosed himself? <laughs> who newly diagnosed? Uh, no, I knew I had it. I never knew what to call. <laughs> uh, but dad had, my dad had it as well. Did he really? Oh, did he did he it really? Yeah. Oh, I missed that part. Yeah. He had it as well. But no, I, for years. If I, because um, I've changed in life, um, so I was telling Vicki, when I was in college, our, our student union, where we had we ate all our meals within the, the basement of the student union building, we'd come out and it was, you know, it was pretty dark and had fluorescent lights, but we'd come out into the daylight sort of thing and you open the, door, the, the glass doors going outside. And every time that I would go up to those doors and, then, and the real light would come upon me, didn't matter what time of year it was, I'd start sneezing. So it got, it got such a joke that when I was in college, before I even open the doors, went up there, my friends would, would, would be would just say, God bless you. And, I think, <laughs> um, and if I like have that sensation I want to see, I can go like turn on the light and like scan over the light bulb sort of thing, look at it, and it'll, that it'll really make it true. And actually it has been it's in literature where, you know, some people like Dr. Valley <laughs> use it for like, you know, comfort because you know you can't sneeze at that point, you can just look get a source of light and you sneeze. Feel better. So I, wave like, and I know you're like. If I was driving the sun, you know, it'll cause me to sneeze. Like, yeah. like the other day, I was driving home, and the, it was late, later in the day, and the sun was mm -hmm. after the west was like right on my, my windshield, and I went to the big sneezing jack, and it was like. Oh my god! Mine's <laughs> <laughs> <Like, laughs> just surprising that some random syndrome you would have. <laughs> <laughs> Why am I not shocked? <laughs> Do you have any of the other ones, like the fullness after meal or anything like that? I've never had the, the fullness after meal, but the um, when my I've, I've had where my eyes been fussed with, like by the eye doctor and stuff. Because it mentioned that you know there like if anesthetic uh, anesthetist tries to give an injection, periocular injection before the surgery, unfortunately they have to withdraw, and it's hard at that time for those patients because. Every time they would sneeze, the anesthetist has to just remove the needle and because they don't want to hurt the eye. So it can be a huge problem. Do you respond to the lidocaine? I've never, never tried. I've never tried lidocaine. I mean, my, my I other thing is that, that, I, that I, I, may, the, I think the, the most I've ever had maybe was like, maybe like six or seven sneezes in a row or something. Oh, very oh, right. No, I mean, it's just, it, I'm not so used to it. At least 100 to be impressive. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> which is one of the most common causes. There, there are these characteristics of these patients. They are uh, mostly adolescent females more than males. There is the presence of a stressor. Um, they don't sneeze in sleep, while they are asleep. And they actually sneeze with eyes open. And some of the case reports actually describe that it's kind of a nasal cough. 
so pretty much they are sneezing with their eyes open. Like, you know, it, it sounds like more cough. And like mm. sneezing with closed eyes is what, you know, you would usually expect with uh, normal sneezing. Mm. So the diagnostic workup that has been reported that people have done for these cases is, you know, just the H and P would it's which is the most important part, but allergy testing has been done, chest and sinus imaging has been done, rhinoscopies have been done, EEG and brain imaging that have been done. Um, and treatment, again, uh, empiric treatment for allergy has mostly been tried for all these patients just because that's the most common thing that people think of. Um, if the testing is positive. Uh, topical anesthetic have been tried and actually I realized that the people have even tried like 10% lidocaine uh, to nasal cavity. Um, apparently some of, some of the cases, um, in some of the cases they gave cocaine in nasal cavity <laughs> and because it's, it's going to, I, I don't know, it's like it's similar. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just weird. Yeah. That when they do right it's been reported. They, they do right Medical cocaine. Yeah. <laughs> so they have no marijuana. Yeah. So uh, again, the other um, other uh, modalities are psychotherapy, hypnosis, behavioral therapy, just suggestions, just telling them that you know most likely this is coming from something that's bothering you or whatever. So um, anti-epileptics have been tried for the ones that were seizures, and antipsychotics, haloperidol, is one of the medications that has been reported to work. So, you know, pretty much I didn't really have a lot that I could find uh, online. It was mainly case reports that have been mentioned, and there are quite a few. I was surprised. I'll start with one which was reported from our institute. Um, Dr. Agarwal and, uh, and Portnoy um, reported this in 1986. It was a 13-year-old female with sneezing episodes with fainting spells, follow, followed by fainting spells. and um, just to, you know, in a short version, I'm going to go over these cases and actually they reveal that um, she was being sexually abused by her stepfather um, in the past and then she realized that the stepfather was moving closer to where they lived and that's where um, the sneezing episode. The, this fact was revealed, it actually resolved just because it came out and, you know, pretty much people knew, I think she felt safer, I guess, and felt her symptoms resolved. Um, another case report from 1989, 11 and a half year old girl who had sneezing episodes that lasted about, about 11 years. Subcutaneous epinephrine was tried for her. It helped on two occasions as per the report and then just relaxation techniques were tried because it recurred later on and pretty much relaxation techniques were tried at that time. Another one from 1993, a 14-year-old male, uh, sneezing episodes were noted and allergy testing was found positive. Um, they, he was given in steroid injections initially. They tried nasal cryotherapy, which last, like the effect lasted for two months after that. Again recurred, they did hypnosis. Finally, they gave him immunotherapy and they did not notice any uh, symptoms for a few months. Later on, he again developed some uh, some sneezing episodes, and then they noticed that he had jerking episodes and falls. EEG was normal at that time, but the brain imaging showed that the fr there was some frontal lobe asymmetry. There was less perfusion on the right side uh, compared to the left, and then they tried haloperidol and dilantin with all these mm, um, brain imaging findings um, to con because they were considering both seizures and psychogenic, I guess. They tried uh, clonidin patches, repeat cryotherapy, nothing helped at that time. And then he developed repeated hand washing and fear of new diseases that were discussed on TV. So he developed like delusions and um, hallucinations or whatever and like obsessive compulsive kind of behavior. They treated him with psychotherapy and fluoxetine at that time and then he was symptom free for two months. So it kind of evolved gradually but the first symptom was just intractable sneezing, so that's just yeah. the strange. Therapy, was that just basically try the, the five branch of the trigeminal? Yeah, it was just for the inferior turbinates, and it, they didn't mention that. They didn't mention why they thought about it. Yeah. So the lidocaine yeah. is basically supposed to sort of numb the trigeminal um, or the branch of the trigeminal, and 
so it just kind of interrupts the process, but uh, like cryotherapy. Yeah. Another one from 1982, 60-year-old female with intractable sneezing. She was treated with 1.5 milligrams of haloperidol, which reduced the frequency, but then they increased the dose and it completely stopped with 5 milligrams twice daily oh, haloperidol. Like or something. Exactly. Like so, yeah, ticks, right. And this kid did not have any other ticks otherwise, and that was, you know, initially we had gone over. Okay. But I don't know if you have numbers and all that. Younger children, is that pretty? It all size this one, yeah. like the yeah. Number. There is one more, like 25 year old, right. but most of them were like teenagers. And, and, and yours was 12, 13, um, 18, eight. Your kid was eight. Yeah. Um, case from 1970, 13 year old male who moved to a new place. Actually, it, uh, uh, this case report had like three cases. 15 year old who had history of conversion disorder and then developed sneezing. I think that would, like the history itself might have helped them with the diagnosis. And then there was a 12-year-old male. Um, they just mentioned that he didn't have like a typical uh, trigger that they could they could figure out. Uh, but what they did was they controlled it by a conditioned reflex, where they gave them all three of them cocaine spray and told them that this is going to help. Them. Like pretty much, you know, told them and like every for each of them it helped every time. And then they substituted that spray with the saline spray without telling them, and they continued to have good response. So that was again strange. Oh, don't really know. Rehab. <laughs> 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 uh, interesting. Like, well, now you're not sneezing, but you're addicted to cocaine. Well, on saline, it's fine. Yeah, but they just they had it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> I know, yeah, really. That's what I'm saying, all of those were like teenagers. <laughs> there was this case from 1985, which was completely factitious. They confronted them, told the family that, you know, looks like, you know, this is just chuckering when, you know, she, I don't know, it just said that they confronted the family and the patient told them that this is not something that's organic. Um, they gave her psychotherapy and chiropractic. So they gave her psychotherapy. Mom initially got like took her to psychotherapy, and then she, when they followed up, they said, "We don't think this is psychological." So they took her to chiropractic, and they said that the chiropractor told her that they found a spinal sneeze point, and they did the therapy, and it. Who knows what they did? But you know, it's all that's reported. But all the ones that are like, that, well, that one specifically, like they're real sneezing though, like they can actually. See, like, see, and, uh, I don't think like this eye closed thing and opening and yeah. whether it was during sleep or uh, uh, not in sleep, these things kind of gradually evolved in the literature, like they saw more cases. But most of them did not have sneezing in, uh, uh, during sleep. Like most yeah. of these psychogenic cases did it's not. hard to make yourself sneeze. Yeah. 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 To like sleep. some of them, if it was psychogenic, would start sneezing, go through the, those hours of sneezing, but could eat in between, could mm. talk, like, you know, it didn't stop them from activity, so. Uh, one more, 1982, it started one month into the use of Miracle White Stain Remover, uh, which was used with laundry detergent. Um, initially, again, all during all these, um, in all these case reports, it has been mentioned that they initially thought it was environmental allergies, treated them accordingly, tried other different things, and over a period of months, they realized that this was started a month or two when uh, they started having sneezing. So tested them for triethanolamine skin sick test, and it was positive. I don't know the standards that were used and all, because they're chemical, how do you, yeah, how do you know, but... And then they stopped using the, uh, the stain remover, and it resolved in two months. So, I wonder if they did the proof on someone else as a control. Mm -hmm. She could just put the chemical on and then put it there. One of uh, the other case in 1995, 15-year-old boy, they actually took this 
this was a psychosomatic, like this was a psychiatric facility that reported. And what they did was they performed this MO barbital interview, but they told them that the MO barbital in the interview for to figure out. Um, all very controversial, but yeah. So there, uh, this uh, the interview revealed that he was being threatened at the school by a boy who had previously attacked him physically and fractured his arm, and he was threatening him to kill him. So this was, you know, the way he was reacting to it. Once it was, once it came out, gradually it just resolved. After that, I'm a barbarian. Yeah. The 25-year-old lady, she was status for rhinoplasty after nasal trauma and post-op day 10 uh, had sneezing episode. It it this went on for like months together where they could not figure out what was going on, tried different medications, uh, nothing worked, again, including the anesthetics and all. And then finally it resolved with ethmoidectomy, uh, which revealed chronic sinus infection. So again, they don't really say that was the cause, but that was where the sneezing res uh, resolved. So we don't really know what actually was the etiology. But infection has been one of the causes that have has been reported. So. Um, this was again interesting, 1992, where uh, this patient, this was a 10-year-old who had allergy to pigweed and dust mites on testing. And um, they did allergy medications, didn't help. <laughs> it improved with nasal packing with 2% cocaine. It resolved, but then had a like exposure to downfill jacket and it recurred. So it typically, you know, they reported as an allergic cause, where right. that caused the amazing episode. 2004, um, uh, this was a case reported where uh, in two 16-year-old females, uh, for both of them actually, their etiology was they were trying to seek attention from the teachers, and it resolved with al alprazolam followed by just suggesting that you know this is what's happening. So they figured out that one of them had a classmate who had similar symptoms who got teacher's attention. And then, you know, pretty much they had a similar episode. Other one had a close friend move out, and that was pretty hard on her and uh, started sneezing. But just suggestion has been strange. <laughs> but it's happening. No, it's strange. It's just not on this system. like any other conversion. Yeah, yeah. Sort of yeah. Thing, I guess. it's going to be really hard to right. like, do all that. Like, how do you actually yeah. make it look real to where somebody can't pick up that you're just making the noise or doing right. that? It's kind of hard to think. Yeah. Um, uh, 21-year-old uh, fe female with sneezing episodes, they found that this patient had TB cervical lymphadenitis, given TB uh, antitubercular medication, and it resolved. Uh, 1964, 39-year-old who had temporal lobe epilepsy, and this was treated with antiepileptics, and it resolved. Um, in 1957, there was zero service. Um, parathyroid adenoma, and it it, uh, it resolved with adenoidectomy. Parathyroid uh, uh, gland was removed, and uh, they they um, they thought it was from recurrent laryngeal nerve compression. Uh, something, but I guess maybe better sympathetic environment. All right. I don't know if this is the last one. This is from 2010. A 12 year old female with decline in the school performance developed sneezing episodes, which was treated with haloperidol, one milligram per day. It reduced the symptoms. But then over a period of two weeks, it completely resolved. They continued it for a month or so, and then gradually weaned it off, and she did well. So most of these cases were psychogenic, but there were like, you know, like TB lymphadenitis, allergy, like whatever the laundry detergent was, some of the environmental allergies. So just a few cases which were different. So for our case, actually, just going back, um, we don't have a clear etiology at this point, but the kid did not continue to sneeze during sleep. He would wake up in one in the morning, would keep sneezing till four in the morning, would be so tired all through the day, would miss school. If he went to school, the teachers would send him back because he would sneeze for like four hours, like pretty much. They would just call them for parents and say they need to 
the kidneys to go go back. And um, they didn't. They said it was like a normal sneeze. He would sneeze with eyes closed. So again, that doesn't favor psychogenic. They refuse any stressors. Only if it is a stressor is a ten-month-old baby in, at home. But mom thought he was coping really well. They didn't think it was psychogenic. We didn't really push it at this point because mostly in these cases it's like a diagnosis of exclusion. So we decided to go with ENT first and then neurology and if neurology said there's nothing more to be done then maybe psychiatry would help. Um, did he have the uh, did he have the phobic issues no, at all? No, no okay. like that. Well it occurred everywhere. So they couldn't try try and place it where yeah, it happened at night during sleep, yeah. so not really. Yeah, I didn't know if there's a part of it that was Which was right, right, right. On the weekend? Yeah. The other thing that I wonder about... Friends, you know, please, like, you know, yeah. where he was having fun. I wonder about if, if um, possibly speech therapy may be of help. The reason I say that is because um, we use them for, for people with vocal cord dysfunction. We use them for people that have um, coughing, you know, mm. coughing suffers with with like contractual coughing or psychogenic cough. But the, the a lot of that is just basically kind of training muscles and trying to, you know, stop, you know, part of the respiratory cycle or whatever. So, I mean, with a sneezing, you take an inspiration, all that sort of stuff, and you're sneezing. I wonder if there's any way that they could do something that might, might help interrupt his, his sneezing episode when they start. You know, like you do with someone who has mm -hmm. a tractable cough or whatever, a psychogenic cough. Or you, when they get that sensation like they're going to sneeze, that you do something, you know, whatever that manipulation may be, and they just kind of break it almost like when you, when you try to stop yourself from sneezing. Yeah, you, you know? yeah, yeah, that's true. Did you find anything about um, the difference in, like, duration and how many times, like, if it was psychogenic versus, like, a pathologic issue? Because, I mean, anything for two to four hours in a row seems really hard, even for a psychogenic thing. I have, I also had one which was, like, 11 hours, like, pretty much. And it was a psychogenic or no? Yeah. So, you know, it doesn't do really, like, yeah, like, in, that, in my mind, that would favor against okay. psychogenic. 30 minutes. Whatever, but or six or seven, ten seasons, whatever, but two to four hours. Yeah, and you know maybe like these ones where they were trying to seek attention from the teacher. Most likely it was short period, right. but uh, I like there were ones which were like hours and hours. Mm. Wow, that's crazy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'm so pretty much I think the anesthetic is just used because you are trying to numb and pretty much block the impulse at the receptor level. That's all I can think of. Um, it has worked for a lot of patients, but has I didn't think it didn't help. help him. No, it didn't help him. He's still sneezing. Like they just apply it like at the first sign, and then it's put. Uh, so they like did that then. for four or five days before I called them for follow up. Right. I mean, called them up for phone follow up, and um, they said nothing's working. They tried it. So I said try because it happens every day for one day. Maybe try it like you know in the morning before it starts, so that because sometimes he wakes up se seven in the morning with sneezing, so that, that doesn't help, but some days he'll sneeze later on, so I said try doing it in the morning with, so that if you, you can see if it lasts for a few hours. But how is it going to say how long it's short? Sure. So it's going to wean right. off, and exactly. then by the time he gets the sneezing episode, the only long. way is like to try to catch him and do it while he's sneezing. And, and, that, that work? and that's what we tried right. to do, but okay. it didn't work. I was just wondering. Yeah, the same as the preventative so. ones. Yeah. And, you know, we tried to present. We had to, like, you know, this was, like, the first case that I ever treated. But you could go up to 10%. But it's like, you know, I, we would rather have ENT or someone do it who have more experience. I rather, you know, you know, when we call neurology and ENT, no one had heard of it. So they were surprised with, you know, just listening to it. But I think at least they have more... Um, Access to they have been trying they have been using lidocaine for rhinoscopies and all I think they would be appropriate to use like something that strong but even haloperidol we thought it would mean that they should go to psychiatry and them start it rather than us starting it but consideration so you know something that should be considered in this case so hopefully we are still working enough so mm. that's crazy. and the actually thing the genetic part of it there's no like actual is there a known mm. defect that you could like not, not that look for or anything like that? No. Okay. I guess it didn't sound like a thing we had any anyway, but 
Yeah, the visitors they know whether it's a new mutation or something. Yeah. Does anybody in the audience have any questions? Listening in uh, today. Anyone have any questions? <clears throat> um, if we have no further questions, I will just we'll thank. Um, I just actually go over the post-its. I guess they are very straightforward. Though. Okay, we'll let Dr. Um, Raja go with the post-its. Um, Psychogenic. Psychogenic. All the above. All the above. All right. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Um, at 11 today, um, we're having um, a session on. Um, Pediatric ethics and pediatric research with Dr. Lanzos. Um, so if you want to come back to the lab, I'll um, uh, be happy that whole lecture. Thanks again. This has been an ACAAI production. To learn more about conferences on line allergy or the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology, go to acaai.org. next time.